Okay, hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Cecilia Sorensen. I am the director of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the short course, El Nino in the Americas, Protecting Health and Increasing Resilience. As we know, El Nino conditions have developed in the tropical Pacific, setting the stage for a surge in temperatures and disruptive weather and climate patterns across the Americas. This course aims to equip the health and meteorologic sectors with the knowledge and tools needed to prepare for local and regional health-related impacts. This includes best practices for management and response and an introduction to available decision-making and risk management tools. This course was made possible through a tremendous collaboration between the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education based at Columbia University, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, the Pan American Health Organization, the World Meteorologic Organization, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. I wanna give a huge thanks to all these partners who came together in this time of urgency to create this short course. We are delighted that you are all here today, and we look forward to hearing your questions and your insights as we learn together over the next three weeks. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Anna Stewart, um, who is the director of the IAI. Gracias, Cecilia. Bienvenidos a todos y todas. Eh, hoy estamos lanzando eh, la primera sesión. Welcome, everyone. Today we are launching the first session of this short course. We know that El Niño is one of the most important factors modulating weather events in our region. So it's important for the healthcare sector and others have good information to be able to plan the response to limit damage in the region. That is why we have made this collaborative effort to bring to this audience relevant information from experts from around the region. Hopefully you will be able to participate actively and become a part of this community of researchers and practitioners working on the intersection between health and the environment. Because we are a non-governmental organization, our role is to ensure governments have relevant information to make decisions, for example, about the effects of El Niño on the health. I would like now to give the floor to my friend Rodney from the WMO. Thank you so much, Anna. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for the World Meteorological Organization, uh, all our colleagues from the other agencies to be introducing this workshop. This is, sets an important precedent on a way to collaborate, achieve synergies, bringing our different perspectives from the meteorological side on ours, providing the information services, also academia, the health sector, from uh, everyone who has the task of prevent uh, is in charge of prevention with everyone who is dealing with systemic risk and all of its components. And this big effort with the World Network of Education on Climate and Health of, the, of Columbia University. And as you can see, this huge effort is reflected in this course that aims to give you a series of resources and tools so that you in your own setting can contribute to climate resilience in the health sector that is so key for our region, especially since we are already in the middle of this phenomena already evolving that is having an impact on the Americas. And in the next few months is going to be even more uh, significant and we need to be prepared. Thank you so much. We already have over 500 participants already. So it's uh, really wonderful to see this response from the audience. Thank you. And with that, we give the floor to our friend and colleague, Daniel Bus. Queridos amigos, bienvenidos Dear al curso friends, de El Niño 
Welcome to this course on Salud Niño, Southern Oscillation, este espacio, desde la OPS, Protecting Health and Increasing Resilience. It's a pleasure for the Organización Mundial uh, Meteorológica Mundial, el IAI, Bajau, eh, Columbia University, nuestros socios de largo Columbia plazo, University, the eh, WMO. ya hemos hecho los We cursos de cambio climático y salud en las Américas. Más de 7000 personas han tomado estos cursos uh, hasta ahora. Taken, y además estamos con el NOAA y también con eh, UNDRR, eh, la Agencia de Naciones Unidas para Reducción de Riesgo a los Desastres. Es un tema fundamental. UNDRR. El tema de los impactos del niño o si la sur sobre la salud. Estamos todos preocupados, This is pero a very preparados y buscando contar con la participación de todos ustedes para estar mejores preparados para aumentar la resiliencia. No solo a so la niño, pero también a los efectos combinados del cambio climático. Niño, como hemos, como hemos hablado en el webinario de lanzamiento de este curso, eh, estamos en un momento donde no tenemos todas las informaciones por cuenta de un territorio desconocido, como hemos hablado, ¿no? donde ya estamos sintiendo los efectos del cambio climático y por encima de eso un el niño que hasta ahora es moderado o estimadamente moderado, pero que los efectos son pueden ser muy importantes uh, para la salud. Así que contamos con todos para pre la preparación del sistema de salud que um, no so solo eh, representa a el sistema de salud eh, al Ministerio de Salud, sino a varios ministerios conjuntos y necesitamos trabajar de manera conjunta para estar mejores preparados para este niño. Así que prepared espero que ustedes eh, lo tomen en el curso Pueden participar so con I comentarios y nos take this eh, course, enseñan you también with lo que están haciendo para que podamos avanzar de manera conjunta so para el combate each a esos efectos muy importantes uh, de la región de las Américas. Así que estaremos juntos eh, en estas próximas so semanas en este curso y enseguida in course, uh, dando uh, over the apoyo a los países weeks, y cooperación then, técnica course, a los que necesitan. Así que muchas gracias por la participación hoy y muchas gracias uh, una vez más a nuestros so socios por la Welcome, preparación de este curso. Muchas gracias. Thank you to the authorities from the organizing institutions. I will now uh, ask you please to show the presentation for the moderator so I can begin introducing myself in the next slide, please. Um, welcome everyone. We already are over 500 participants are have joined so thank you thank you for your attention and your time i am edwin castellanos i am the science director of the inter-american institute for global change research iai and i'm located in guatemala and it, for me it's an honor really to be moderating this first session Please go ahead to, with the second slide. And I want to remind all participants that we have interpretation in English and Spanish. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can find a button that says interpreting. There you can select your language, Spanish or English. The rest of the presentations for today are going to be in Spanish, but you can choose to listen to them in English. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, so this today's session is the first of a series of sessions that we have prepared for this course. Today, we're going to be discussing droughts, food production and nutrition. And as you can see, we have other sessions then next week we are when next thursday we're dealing with heat extremes and then we have other two other sessions next week on water quality and security disaster and risk reduction 
vector-borne and zoonotic diseases and air quality to finish. So these are very different topics. And we also had a webinar last week that I hope you were able to attend. Next slide, please. We see that this course was developed for the purpose of describing the anticipated meteorological impacts of ENSO in the region and likely resulting health impacts. So to explain how ENSO conditions may impact health, such as health um, through extreme temperatures, changes in vector-borne and zoonotic diseases, impacts on food and water security, etc. And we want to develop capacities in the region so that we can have a response to this. We want this course to be as practical as possible so that decision makers will have the tools to deal with this extreme situation that we're dealing with. Please uh, go ahead, next. Each of the sessions that we saw in the previous slide in, in the schedule is a 90 minute session. Over the 90 minutes today, we're going to have three presentations. I'm going to introduce the speakers in a minute. And at the end of the three presentations, we're going to have a short time for Q&A. So you can uh, start writing your questions in the chat or even better, using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. These sessions will be recorded and posted on the website and will be available within 24 hours. So if someone hasn't been able to attend, the recording will be available within 24 hours. We also have reference materials that will be included in the course website. Next, please. This is a course for which we are providing people who attend at least four of the six live sessions. That is a 70% uh, participation uh, percentage. We are offering a certificate and the certificate will also have the requirement of taking a final exam for which you will have to earn a score of over 70%. So you should have registered with your email. And in that email, you will receive the exam on October 26. You will have 24 hours to complete it and then return it. And that is the other requirement for receiving the certificate. Your attendance to each of the sessions will be automatically recorded as soon as you join the Zoom session. Next, please. The presentations that we see today and in all of the sessions will be available and can also be downloaded from the site. There's a, a website for the course where we post all of the materials, the recordings, for the different sessions. Next, please. It's also important to note that for today, because we're going to be dealing with nutrition and food security, the uh, PAHO has already prepared a document with short-term recommendations for uh, addressing the food safety concerns. So in that website, you're, you're going to be able to download this sheet that was prepared by PAHO. As we were saying at the beginning, we want this, this course to be as practicable, uh, as practical and applicable as possible. And so we have prepared these documents with recommendations. Well, so now we go into the main part of today's session. I want to take a few seconds to thank our panelists 
for being here and I want to introduce them to, to you first. We're going to hear Rodney Martinez with an introduction on the El Nino situation. He is a representative from the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization for North America, Central America and the Caribbean. He's a member of a former Navy officer, an oceanographer, and has a BMA in Development Projects Management. He has been a member of the World Climate Research Program and a member of the Scientific Observation Committee. So thank you, Ronnie, for being here. I'm going to introduce all of the speakers right now so we can go straight into the presentations. After Rodney, we are going to uh, listen to Julian Carrasona Losen, a Spanish and Honduran national with a master's degree in rural development from the University of London and a degree in agricultural engineering from the Polytechnic University of Madrid. He has 26 years of experience in rural development, food security, and project cycle management with NGOs and agencies of the United Nations system in Latin America and the South Caucasus. For the past three years, he has been working as an agriculture officer for the sub-regional office of the FAO for Mesoamerica. So he's going to give us the main uh, presentation on how El Niño will and is already affecting food security. And then we also have Andres Bucaro, an agronomist from Guatemala with a master's degree in soil sciences. For the last seven years, he has worked with CRS, participating in the construction of the water smart agriculture approach, mainly in the Central America dry corridor. He has recently been appointed as president of the board of the Guatemalan Association of Soil Sciences. And Andres is going to be discussing his practical experience, field experience, on how to deal with droughts to help food producers. As you see, we have a very distinguished panel with a lot of knowledge on El Niño and its effects on food safety. So with nothing else, I give the floor to Rodney Martinez so he can discuss El Niño and how we are living it and what is expected to happen over the next few months in the continent. Thank you, Rodney. You can continue. Thank you, Edwin. I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see it. Yes, we can see it, but can you have it on presentation mode, please? Just give me a second. There it goes. Thank you, everyone. Very briefly, I would like to share as introduction what is happening with uh, El Niño. And I wanted to share with you this image about yesterday. As you can see, the temp OSHA temperature the surveillance, uh, Rodney, sorry to interrupt, because we cannot really see what you're showing us. I've changed it. It's on my screen. Unfortunately, we can only see your first slide. Maybe you can refresh it. There we see the ocean temperatures. There might be a, a delay. Okay, so on the right panel, as you can see on the right table, according to the thresholds and the levels being reached with El Niño in different areas of El, the Pacific, we are already talking about a moderate El Niño that can go stronger in the coming weeks. Depending on the different regions, 
as we know, it affects all the Americas. So this was just to show you that El Nino is happening, it is evolving, so it's important to consider it. Let me know if you could see the slide. Regarding atmosphere matters, we have talked a lot about adjusting to El Nino and how the atmosphere is changing. Basically, what we see on the left side is how the winds, those orange and red areas, show the anomalies in the wind and how that is related to the ocean. This is what is happening, the adjusting that is happening. As you can see, the red color, those anomalies are consistent with an El Nino event. This means that for Latin America, especially, humidity is going to increase. And this is going to uh, be according to what has been predicted so far. Of course, every El Nino is different. This one is going to be completely different. If we want to see patterns related to the previous ones, it seems Rodney's internet has frozen. Let's wait for a couple of seconds, otherwise we can move on to Julian's presentation. Julian, are you available to take over? Yes, I'm sitting, waiting here. Maybe we can have Julian do the presentation. And then we go back to Rodney when his connection improves. Okay, Julian, so we can uh, move on to your presentation. Can you confirm that you're seeing the presentation? Yes, we can see your screen. And can you see the entire presentation, right? Good morning, everyone. Congratulations to the organizers for accomplishing this event. For FAO offices for Mesoamerica, we're very grateful for this opportunity. As you can see on the image, my presentation focuses mainly on the effects of El Nino on agriculture and food safety and nutrition. I'd like to show you the contents for this presentation. I will talk about the weather patterns for El Nino, the forecast for 2023 and 2024. I had a few sections prepared in case Rodney hadn't covered them, and I will cover them very briefly so that I'm not overlapping his presentation. Later on, we'll talk about the impacts on agriculture, on food safety and nutrition, and also our approach as FAO to El Nino and the recommendations for action in terms of anticipation, preparation, response, strengthening of resilience, risk impact analysis, monitoring and alertness, and of course, suggested bibliography. As you might all know, El Nino is a natural phenomenon characterized by the higher temperature of oceans and seas in the Pacific. 
during El Niño, the normal rainfall and temperatures increase. And in terms of weather, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we have big patterns. We have rainfalls that are below average the south corridor and also on uh, coastal um, sides we have um, above average rainfall in the coast areas of northern peru and southern ecuador as well in some countries in south america as you can see in Par brazil paraguay chile in the case of the caribbean the historical patterns are not uniform regarding uh, the forecast for this el nino we have information from the national american uh, forecast office saying that there is a 95 percent probability that el nino will persist until the first quarter of 2024 and 71 percent probability that the event will be strong a strong El Nino phenomenon does not necessarily imply that the impacts will be severe, but rather than they are more likely to occur. The forecasts for the quarter October to December 2023 show a trend in line with historical patterns. meaning below average rainfall in the northern areas of southern america and the opposite in the lower parts of south america according to the models the monthly average of anomalies in accumulated precipitation are valid for january february and march 2024 as you can see on the right side of the presentation. So there's going to be persistent conditions in most of the Southern corn and also in uh, the coast of Peru and Ecuador. Also, there is a probability of rainfall above average in uh, Mexico and some areas of Central America, having low average rainfall in the northern area of Brazil, Guyana, Suriname, that area of the continent. Before we look at the impacts, I think it's important to consider the different scales at which we carry out research policies and implementation of climate actions. We have different scales that have to be considered in terms of time for example we can look at the present weather we can do short term medium term forecasts we can do forecasts for a production cycle or for the next quarter or next year We can do even forecasts for the coming 20 years. So this gives us a wide range of scales in terms of time. One, we can do the same thing for geographical areas. For example, we can cover only a um, whole country, a whole region, uh, or at subnational level or at a global level. We can also look at different skills in terms of focus of our research. We can look at global weather impacts or we can focus on the risk analysis of extreme events. 
we can focus on something even smaller. For example, we can look at the beginning of the um, sowing season. We can predict the um, yield of a crop. So we can go on the scale from a wider to more concrete, not limited, but more concrete. So we can and should play around with these different scales. When we implement actions, when we design policies in terms of climate action. Most of my presentation focuses on Central America as it is where my office is a focus. I'm, I apologize in advance if I'm not covering a wider area. I think that Central America is a good example, a good paradigm example in terms of how El Nino is going to affect production. Trout in Central America has a different definition compared to other regions in the world. Even in our country, we talk about 2,000 millimeters of rainfall and we talk about drought. Maybe someone in Egypt, in Israel, can laugh about that. How can you talk about drought if you have so much rainfall? So that's why it's important to specify that for us in Central America, a drought is the following. It's uh, something different because it's cyclical. It happens at almost every year and it's closely related to El Nino phenomenon. In Central America, rainfall has a bimodal distribution. We have a rainy season that goes until May and then the dry season is in the in the next semester. And it has maximum periods where those rainfall seasons decrease. And in those decreased seasons, we call them canicula or dry spell. That usually takes two months, up to two months, it can take two weeks, four weeks, but only two weeks can be bad enough to affect crops. And this dry spell or canicula can be intense even when the total rainfall stays close to average. We can have a thousand or 1500 millimeters that is uh, in line with the total average. Despite that, we have sometimes those dry spells or caniculas that have a negative impact on the crops. So for us, a drought has to do with an anomalous distribution of rainfall. And it affects Central America as much as it uh, changes crops duration and also the rainfalls can change in when they begin and when they finish. So as you can see, for us, um, a drought means um, an alteration of the rainfall cycles. Just to give you an example, FAO and action against hunger and uh, the EU, they developed a um, piece of research about the drought season in Central America. And they found out that there are Central American areas that are highly, uh, have a light, high likelihood of drought, as you can see on the map that include 
El Salvador, Nicaragua, and other countries. So there is an interaction between the dry spell and El Niño. The presence of El Niño phenomenon and the anomalies in the sea surface temperatures of the Atlantic Ocean are the variables that explain the intensity and duration of the canicula with the highest statistical significance. With climate change, we know that ocean temperatures are increasing. That leads to more intense El Niño phenomenon. Therefore, more accentuated or stronger dry spell seasons as well. Let's talk about the scale perspective. We see the El Niño in 2023, 2024. We look at the past to see what are the rainfall patterns, but then we need to look at the following 20, 70 years. So in this period, in the future, the rainfall patterns that have been changing in the last decades will become, will be more altered in the future. So for this, I analyze the rainfall periods, how long the dry spell lasts. There is a UNESCO piece of research that um, includes this image, and it shows that the dry spell tends to become more evident uh, since the um, beginning of climate change. In a more unfavorable scenario and for 2080 and 2090, there can be um, a difference of up to 90% that will affect Nicaragua, Honduras, and other countries in Central America. Also, we they forecast an, incre an increase of the dry spell of up to uh, for additional three weeks, up to 20 days in some of the blue spots you see on the map, mainly in Guatemala and some in the border between Nicaragua and Costa Rica. And this will affect or alter the crop cycles and the agriculture systems as a whole. So the charts on the left, for example, are from a study uh, by, done from from by the uh, Latin American integration system, and so we have that bimodal um, rain pattern with two peaks, uh, and those ten, those peaks tend to disappear. Uh, do I have a pointer? Yes. Uh, see, you have this bimodal pattern, as I was showing before, a peak in June and then another peak in September. So we have the a similar pattern in Guatemala, it's uh, less pronounced in Costa Rica or Belize, but it's mm, overall the same. And the red lines are the predicted patterns of rain. And it, with this pattern, we don't have that first peak. We only have one large peak around September or October. If you can see it's repeated, there's only one peak in the others. That is a radical change for these uh, systems because in the basic grain, dry land or, or rain fed uh, agriculture, that is organized around two cycles. Uh, from August to November, there's the, the second cycle. So if the rain pattern, as we know it, disappears, then the agriculture system as a whole 
will will change and we perhaps are going to have a longer but just one cycle perhaps with different crops we don't know yet another example and on the chart on the right that was done by some researchers in the international uh, center of tropical agriculture in colombia and the red areas show that the climate change, the not, not the, the least favorable uh, climate change scenario, but we see coffee that is a, a very significant crop in, in terms of the culture, the economy, uh, but also the environment, I would dare to say, in, in that area is going to be unsuitable and it's not going to be possible to substitute it, for example, for cocoa. And then we have a large part of Honduras, uh, even a, a section of the south of Mexico in Chiapas. So these are examples of, of the future scenarios that we have with climate change. Another example, this chart was done by International Conservation, the SIAT. So 2030, which is pretty much the day after tomorrow in practical terms, we have in these areas um, this uh, a net change of almost 26%. So we need uh, agricultural zoning that takes into account the future scenarios and impacts. In terms of the impacts on agriculture, well, we're already seeing that agriculture itself absorbs 26% of the damages and direct losses from caused by natural disasters, but in, for, uh, for droughts, it's 82%. And this is very relevant in Latin America and the Caribbean, where 85% of the agriculture is dry land agriculture, and it's itself very sensitive to temperature changes. Even without droughts, the changes in temperature and drive and rainfall affect um, the uh, other things. Uh, and with very small changes, uh, we already have issues with pests and so if we have long-term significant changes this is going to be even more so now going more into detail on the kinds of impacts that can happen we have some large groups we have because of a fall in rainfall and changes in temperature in the oceans and we have four large areas that are going to be affected. Agriculture, livestock, fishery, and aquaculture. Uh, I'm not going to read all of them, but uh, because you have this table and you also have the uh, literature references, but I would like to highlight that not impacts are for the agriculture or productive. We also need to take into account the social impacts. For example, the lack of rainfall, of course, uh, causes um, crop failure or the death of livestock, but it also entails a loss of paid jobs. If I lose my crop because of the drought, I don't need workers to, to harvest that crop. If the water, if the rainfalls are reduced, we're going to have social conflicts between competing uses for that um, water, that resource that is scarce. So we can have social conflicts for the use um, between agriculture and cattle raising, between 
aquaculture and human consumption or industrial use. So those conflicts need to be considered because we cannot just study the impacts on the production or, or the agriculture or for cattle raising. We need to go a bit beyond that in order to determine the impacts. Then also for excess rainfall, um, again, it's not just about the loss of crops. We also need to to go and see those time scales that I was discussing when there is too much uh, rain. For example, we have landslides, nutrients are washed out from the soil. There's contamination of, of water, bodies of water. There's uh, There are losses as well for fishery. And this doesn't just affect this productive cycle, the present one but also future ones. So when we look at impacts again, I need to consider all of the different scales in, of time as well. And finally, we have the changes in temperature in the oceans that particularly affect fishery and agriculture. And we have changes in the food chains or in the habitats in coral reefs or the, also the, the appearance of new pathogens or harmful algae, for example, or seaweed. So it's not just the effects on the current productive cycle, but we have longer term impacts that we need to, to take into account for our analysis. In terms of the impacts on food security and, and nutritional security, well, we have negative impacts on the four components of nutritional and food security. So availability, access, and stability, the reduction of uh, income for, for the workers in countries that are strongly dependent on agriculture, this immediately um, increases poverty. So the most vulnerable groups are disproportionately affected. And these challenges overlap with other challenges that we have already been dealing with for a few years. We have limited economic growth in most of these countries. We are still recovering from COVID. We have high inflation due to different reasons that affects the price of food, but also the price of uh, commodities. So these are all overlap. So we cannot uh, restrict the effects of, of El Nino and separate them from the effects of climate change or other circumstances. They overlap and they achieve uh, critical levels in social terms, which can cause uh, that families affected by the droughts, by El Nino, by climate change, will make the decision to migrate sometimes within their countries to larger cities that have a higher demand for work, for labor, but also abroad. When um, the reasons for which populations migrate, uh, populations from uh, Central America migrate to the US have been studied and one of the main, uh, one of the four main reasons that people state are events such as droughts, hurricanes, and floods, and how they have uh, affected their, their families in a recurrent way, in a recurring way. And this is important because by 2050, it is estimated that Mexico and Central America might have 3.9 million people 
migrating to the US for climate reasons, aside from the other reasons. So that, that's the prediction that we have. And so all of these impacts that we see in agriculture that are then also uh, translated into the food security, and they end up being one of the factors that triggers human mobility in Central America. So again, these are all phenomena that are in that are linked, and we cannot look at them in isolation. And the last part of my presentation, I'm going to go uh, into how the FAO addresses these impacts and what recommendations we, we suggest. Basically, I would like to start uh, setting three basic principles. First, the fact that it's necessary to implement anticipatory actions and actions that increase resilience uh, focused on agriculture and agricultural livelihoods because it reduces the cost of the human response, humanitarian response. And second, uh, country leadership. The countries that suffer the impacts of El Niño and climate change are taking action to address that. And uh, we need that leadership from them. Our role as organizations is to provide technical assistance or, or share the lessons learned that we might bring from other places, but they need to take leadership because the countries already have strategies, they have the knowledge, they have actions. Sometimes uh, they just need financial resources, but we, we don't have to plan or develop strategies uh, with our backs to the country's institutions. And then the third approach, as we say in Spain in, and in some Latin American countries, uh, you can't uh, bite off more than you can chew. I hope the interpreters were able to translate this, but we cannot deal with everything um, at the same time. So we need to be able to prioritize our actions, prioritize by more affected countries, by more affected territories, by sectors or value chains where we can have a bigger impact. We need to be able to prioritize by causes of vulnerability or by vulnerable groups, but dealing with everything all at once is not going to be possible because our resources, and when I say ours, I, I mean the countries, the institutions, the international funders are, are limited. And so basically we have three access for action and recommendations. The first one is anticipation, preparation, and response. The second one is strengthening resilience. And the third one is analyzing risk, impact, monitoring, and alert. In terms of anticipation, preparation, and response, as I was saying, in the FAO, we have studies that show that investment in, anticipa in anticipation yields a very significant return. Every dollar invested generates $7 in avoided losses for disasters and uh, added uh, benefits. So there are some keys that define the, the focus for the anticipatory action. The first one is the use of meteorological information. The second one is strengthening early alert systems, then uh, planning anticipatory actions. What actions am I going to use to respond to which threats and when? What are going to be the triggers? The preparation for implementation, for example, having simulations, 
and funding any pre-assigned funding that we can have again countries institutions any financial funds that have already been allocated to this. We don't need to go into more expense or reassign um, from the national budget. We need uh, allocations in the social mechanism uh, that is already working from which I can allocate additional funding that will allow me to quickly increase coverage. Uh, you have three more minutes, Julian. Great, uh, I'll go quickly. Then strengthening resilience, this is key to use sustainable agriculture practices that are adapted to the climate. Agricultural planning, planning the cycles, having financial mechanisms to increase the scale and the ambition of our efforts for resilience. And why do we need to increase in ambition and scale? It's because practices are not taken up as quickly as they should. This study from 2016 looked at the adoption rates for practices for agriculture, agroforestry, and livestock production and they looked at where adoption was remarkable and they saw that there was better in, in the ones that were uh, being adopted, there was access to information, there was uh, integration of people, there was uh, land security and we need um, some financial help as well because early adoption and adoption is costly for producers. So we need support for producers, uh, for uh, farmers for to be able to, to take this new practice. I'm going to go quickly over this. Now we have risk impact and impact analysis, monitoring and alert. We need to connect to the governance of the countries. The FAO has a system, a global system for damage and loss assessment. And, and we share this with the countries, it's available. We have the ACES the to monitoring agricultural droughts it's being used its strategies are being used we have national measuring uh, systems we have national measuring exercises for droughts and for food insecurity y en ella podemos encontrar cómo la sequía en la tercera década del mes pasado se estaba o se venía desarrollando. And here we can see how over the last decade uh, the droughts that were happened over the last decade. And so here I'm going to give you three slides with literature references that I have mentioned over my presentation and everything is freely available on the internet. And again, well, thank you. And I'm here if you have any questions or comments and there you have my email. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you for your time and the great presentation. We're going to uh, listen back to Rodney who was talking about the meteorological effects of El Nino. He had a little connection issue, but now uh, he will take 10 minutes to do his presentation. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, there was a um, power cut in my building. But what I wanted to emphasize was uh, 
how the El Nino is changing and how uh, this increasing temperature has changed. This is part of the normal cycle regarding the atmosphere. The area winds are adjusting to these anomalies. In highness, they are not responding to the classical cycle. That is what is affecting the forecast. In terms of models that we run, this is what we expect for November, December, and January next year regarding the ocean temperature. As you can see, this is a very specific configuration of El Nino. This not only affects South America, but also Central America. Regarding the atmosphere, one of the conditions in the past, especially in 2015 and 16, some changes of, in the effects of El Nino have changed. And in any case, the forecast for the coming forecast are not negative. And something that is important to consider is that the forecast models show the changes more in the south, as you can see on the left map. So it won't have a very negative effect. As you can see on the right hand side, this is the normal cycle of an El Nino. Well, November, December and January, we will, will see a clear sign for Ecuador and northern Peru and also southeast of South America, where you can see anomalies in rainfall above average and there is a deficit of rainfall in a big area of Brazil and other countries in the region. And in the Caribbean, there is a contrast between the north of South America and the Caribbean Sea. So when we look at individual models, such as the CFC of NOAA, the North American office, you see a contrast between November, December, and January 2024, when we see that uh, in more detail, there is not actually a deficit in rainfall. We have seen a change in the model that suggests above average rainfall for that period that are important. And that, of course, affects the Caribbean islands, especially uh, the islands in the north of South America. When we talk about November, December, January, and this, we see a lot of consistency among anomalies of rainfall that is above average in the north west of South America and also in the southeast of South America, as uh, we can see on the left side. And what catches our attention is the lack of rainfall in that more yellow area. This is the information that we have between January, December, November, December and January. Regarding recommendations, we have been uh, sharing this information with different representatives of organizations. Actually, we did that in different countries. And I would like to take this time to emphasize on the following recommendation. We cannot talk about an early El Nino alert anymore. We do as an institution, we do that. But at this point, what is fundamental is to follow the national forecasts regarding rainfall above 
average or below average that we will have in the coming time, which is the sub-season forecasts. And at this point, it is fundamental that we follow closely those local forecasts. We see that El Nino is developing, but that information is not enough to understand the impact. So for that, we have to look at national sources. And something that is fundamental is inter-sector, inter-institution coordination, and also between the national and regional level. That has always uh, been not enough. So we have to look also at the role of the private sector. And we have said this months ago, how we share information about risk management and risk prevention. And this applies to all sectors. In many countries, budgets uh, finish or uh, in December, and it's exactly at that time, at the end of December, when El Nino will have a greater impact in the region. And in the past, that led to a series of problems to respond to the phenomenon. There is an army of El Nino experts in uh, social media, and they tend to confuse people. So it's important not to follow fake news. We have to look for official sources. We know there is valuable information. We have to be able to filter information. And we have to be proactive in the way we disseminate information. We understand we have to understand what is happening in Central America at the moment is not going to be the same in uh, South America or the Southern Kong. So we need to gather enough information to see what's coming next. On the other hand, with all the information that we have so far, we have an El Nino that is moderated and that means that there are high probabilities to have impacts in different areas and subregions in the Americas and the Caribbean. And the different, more short term forecasts from meteorological organizations are fundamental. And those are the ones that shall be used to reflect the local and present situation. El Nino. Will, might be one of the hottest in the in history. We might not have a repeated pattern because this Nino for this cycle has very specific characteristics that has have not been seen in the past. So we have to be prepared. We know that local and regional authorities have enough time to prepare themselves. Since June, we have been saying that the El Nino is developing and it might affect all areas of development. And it's important to mitigate those risks with preventive measures. And we have not to repeat malpractices in the past. We have to look at science to develop recommendations on that. Because what matters the most is to have a resilient population that has to be ready for the coming changes. Thank you, Rodney, for that great presentation and uh, highlighting the those more salient aspects to be considered. We're coming to the third presentation for today. We will cover 
Now, presentation Andres Bucaros. Presentation, who will talk about what has been done in uh, on his experience. We can see the general slide for the course. Yes. Thank you for inviting me. I would like to present this case study, which is water and soils for agriculture. This is something that we have been working on in a participatory way with other colleagues, and this work involves the effort of many people, including short scale farmers, including rain fed farmers and that I will explain more later on. So what I would like to emphasize is on revi revitalizing small scale rain fed agriculture. And that is because most food production is in the hands of small scale farming families, families like this one. And these rural families are the ones who have the most challenges. We know that three quarters of world food production depends entirely on rainfall. Most of the times we think about irrigation when we think about farming, but the truth is that most food production is rain fed. So it entirely depends on rainfall. And the third element is that We have a big amount of farmers who depend on rainfall, so we have to take care of it. So this is uh, the background for this presentation today. So there are two ideas about water and soil for agriculture. First, we have to see soil as a um, source of food for crops. There's even a Netflix documentary about uh, Falcon, Mark and Rockstrom, who are researchers who try to change the paradigm in people about agriculture. Most of the water that is available for human beings comes from rainfall. As you can see on the diagram, most of the water comes from rain or blue water. And then we have green water that goes down as rain and that can be used by plants to grow. So right after raining, the scientists say that only 3% of the water becomes blue water. 90% of fresh water becomes or has the potential to become green water. So two thirds of fresh water that is available to human beings is underground. So we have to look at that as um, an opportunity. If we look at the green map, we see how much the Americas depend on this kind of water. You see how the distribution of blue water and green water displays. We can see that green water availability is even more important. And if we look at the data, we see that 6,800 cubic kilometers of water are needed per year 
for global food production. And to sustain a diet of 3,000 kilocalories per day, we need 1,300 square meters of water per year. That is equivalent to 3.6 square uh, meters of water per day. So to alleviate hunger in the developing countries, it is necessary to double the amount of water used in food production. We don't, we know we don't have enough surface water to perform irrigation. Of course, I'm not saying that we shouldn't foster irrigation, but if we want to solve the problem in a more um, structural way, we need to think about rain fed agriculture. Also, we have to understand or see soil as a store of carbon. As we can see on this screen, we can see the amount of carbon in the soil in the biosphere coming from timber, our bodies also have carbon, and the amount of carbon in the soil in as organic matter and as mineral. The PGC are the millions of tons of carbon. And what I want to show you here is that if we think about storing carbon, what would be the most logical storage place? It would be soil, because soil has a lot of capacity to store carbon and because if it's there it can be stored for a long time if it's stored in the atmosphere it's going to return to its uh, original source uh, very quickly so we have to think about how we can change the scenario into a more productive scenario so what what we have uh, been looking at is different practices that include these principles that are planning for land restoration and climate risk management conservation agriculture and agroforestry integrated management of soil fertility, sustainable pasture management, and continuous learning and innovation. So this focus has two main ideas. First, more efficient use of green water. That means more food per each raindrop. Also, we need healthier soils with more carbon. And that can happen if we have more biomass per each crop cycle, because this biomass will make the most of the carbon. So uh, we can see um, degraded soil here. We see also the sequestration of carbon and there is some part of water that is used to grow uh, plants. And if we go from the degraded soil to the healthy soil model, we see that the, um, the soil will be better preserved and water will be better used to make plants grow. This is a way to reduce the effects of greenhouse emissions. So it is convenient for us to do a better management of soil. And we will have a more virtuous cycle with more uh, healthier soil, more biomass, more organic matter, more green water, more food. And that means that we can use that material for uh, better crops. And so now I'm going to show you some evidence that we have uh, generated. Uh, it's about Central America, but on principle, it, it applies to any region. 
the first subsoils that are the healthiest are the ones that have organic matter. Mm, it's said that it's difficult to add carbon to this matter, but it, it is difficult, but it can be achieved. And as we can see over the first year, we have increased them significantly. We have achieved uh, 1.8 tons of sequestered carbon. Uh, in conservation terms, it might be a small amount, but this is really significant. And here we can see the productivity of water. It's how much food I can produce by drop of rainfall uh, for a millimeter of kilogram per hectare by a millimeter of rainfall. And we have uh, a good number. We're, they're not very controlled um, experiments under the conditions we have, but they are real life cases. And you can see during the first year by changing the practice, we have a much more effective use of the water and the soil. And this difference with, between conventional and, and more efficient uh, practices uh, increases every year, water productivity increases. And even though we have more severe winters as the one we had in this region in 2018 with a very severe drought, the amount of water is represented by the light blue bar we we see uh, that there's a, a significant increase. Uh, and then the third piece of evidence that is the more sensitive for the rural population is more food. So healthier soil with better managed water represents a better yield, even with the fluctuations that we have because of the, the extreme weather events. So we see maize in the first uh, part was uh, much more sensitive to the droughts. And, but finally, my message is, what is the principle behind all of this? Well, healthy soils, but the soils are not just healthier because they have more organic matter, but because the functionality of the microorganisms that they have is better. And here I have evidence of the genome analysis of the soil of the soil biome. And the, it shows that with the change practices, the soils have a, a higher functionality of the organisms there. We have 115 different species identified in this person's land, the, the man that was in the picture. And we have these species of microorganisms that are not in the conventional plot. We have uh, this bacteria that that uh, fixates the free life nitrogen, and we have these microorganisms that will increase the fun functionality of the soil. And we can measure this with indicators. But basically, uh, since the first year that we changed the practices, we started seeing that the soil had a higher quality, perhaps with less biodiversity, uh, but with a better functionality uh, in that soil microbiome. And so we have better resilience. So the final message is we need healthy soils. And this is uh, FAO's uh, message, healthy soils for a healthy life. We need a more efficient to better uh, manage the water. We need healthy soils so that extreme weather events uh, because they're more recurrent and they affect the production of food and in rain fed and small scale producers and affect the nutritional situation of rural populations. And of course, we first we need to change uh, sh to shift the paradigm in our heads about water availability to be realistic. That's the first step because there are things that we cannot change. We cannot change the weather events. We require uh, more uh, healthier soils that take into account not just uh, agricultural production, but also the health of the population. And this is all considered under one health uh, conception. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andres, for your great presentation.
and for showing how a good management of the soil can bring so many benefits, not just for water management, management, but also for carbon sequestration, for adaptation and mitigation to climate change. So thank you to our three speakers. We are close to 800 people uh, in this call. So we see uh, that there is a great interest in, in this, in the situation. And also we see your interest in all of the questions that you have asked in the Q&A. Unfortunately, you can see, uh, you already know that we have 90 minutes for these sessions and we're close to, to the closing time right now. But I wanted to tell you, to remind you that in the website, you're going to have not just the presentations that you heard today, but also a series of additional documents, especially one that was prepared by the by PAHO with specific recommendations for addressing the impacts of El Nino for food security and for nutrition. Many of the questions you have asked are about what well what can we do so that uh, document i'm posting the link in the in the chat right now uh, this document includes many recommendations and now we're going to take a few minutes because we don't have much time to answer some general questions about what you have asked one question that had to do with the uncertainty in the models. And it has to do with the fact that rainfall in the region is very variable. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the models. So someone asked, I think it's more for Rodney, uh, what simulation models are you using for rainfall? And how can we take into account the effects of microclimates? Because some uh, and some regions with a different topography, such as the Andes, uh, affect the, the uncertainty of the model. So how can we take all of that into account? Not just for the coming months, but also coming years. Well, thank you so much for the question, because this is a training course. Um, well, we need to be uh, use precise terminology. Projections are done under certain scenarios and estimates of how certain weather parameters are going to behave in the future, perhaps decades from now. And what I presented as a result is a combination of many models generated by the global prediction centers. Uh, global forecast centers that work with information from all around, from the surface, for, from higher places, from ocean level. So they cannot include the information of the microclimates. And that is why it's important, and I emphasize that in my presentation, is that for that kind of granular information, we need the, the forecast of national meteorological uh, agencies, and we need to put everything uh, that we see at the large scale in the maps together, but monitor the local national level information and the forecast from each meteorological ser service that also take into account microclimates, topography, etc. And that is where we have the highest uncertainty because we are not, not just uh, what we see at the large scale maps uh, is not necessarily going to happen in this smaller scale. Thank you so much, Rodney. And one question for Andres that I found interesting is that we said that the rain that is absorbed in the soil is going to, to be helpful. The green uh, rain, the, the, the green rain that you mentioned is going to make our crops more protective. But what happens in places where there, there is no green in some very deserted places in South America, what can they do? Oh yes, it's a, absolutely, it's a valid question. There are some places where watering is the only 
option for producing foods, but using that water more efficiently, uh, that is still valid as in general. Uh, on average in the world, it's between 10 to 15% of the water we use for irrigation is the water that the plants use for, for growing. So the same conservation uh, principles apply and would help uh, irrigation-based systems to make a more efficient use of the water. And this has economic impacts, but also um, uh, uh, in the environment. Thank you, Andres, for your short answer and for uh, which shows how well you, you know your subject. And um, something for Julian, uh, can you give us your opinion on the uh, structural economic issues that we have, uh, the crisis that we have in the region and how climate change is falling on top of that and is and uh, you also connected that to migration, which is a, also a complex issue derived as well from that economic uh, crisis. So uh, what's, uh, what's our way out? We have these complicated political economic situations in a region. And then on top of that, now we have climate change. Well, yes, that's the point precisely. Um, five years ago, uh, there was uh, the, they conducted these interviews to the migrants that arrived in the U.S. and they only mentioned there were three large reasons for deciding to migrate. One was poverty, another one was security, and then the third one was their desire to reunite with their families that members that had migrated before and from then to to this moment that we are the, the new thing is we have a fourth reason that is climate change and they are uh, using these words they're calling it climate change they they used to say well we are losing crops but now they explicitly say climate change and this is a, a huge change as you said uh, so it's a factor that is uh, getting on top of all of the other ones and well about solutions well yes it's a it's a very complex question it's a very complex issue But I think we need to go back and look at rural livelihoods in, in the territories from which these people come in a very comprehensive way. And we need to, to see how we can build better partnerships between ourselves, because as I said before, you cannot uh, bite off more than you can chew, because you cannot see water and soil on one side and not look, the, look at rural livelihoods and not look at access to the land. Uh, Andres might agree with me, I cannot promote agricultural and forestry systems that uh, respond to these all these issues if I don't guarantee access to the land and that is a structural issue in the in the region and it's going to be very difficult for a producer that has access to the land to adopt these practices because if they don't have the means uh, because uh, I can't, uh, I don't implement that today and get uh, a benefit in, in three months' time. It might take years. So we need all organizations, instances, ministries. I, I emphasize the local and the national level. Uh, they all need to, to contribute with their strengths and we need coordination because each of us in our, on our own are, are preaching in the desert. Over for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julian. Of course, these are complex issues that require complex and, and comprehensive approaches. And as we saw today, we need to, to look at this from all the sides, the agriculture, the weather, the climate, and our 
our fo main focus is health, of course, and so we need to look at the, the population's health. So we are now reaching the end. Apologies, because we went a bit over time, but this was a very enriching discussion. We have a lot to discuss. I will remind everyone who is with us today that we have many documents available in the course's website that you can download the presentations and all of those materials and some other useful information. On Thursday, we meet at the same time to discuss, to have the second session that deals with extreme temperatures and how we deal with the heat waves that are becoming more frequent. So please uh, continue taking part. We have two sessions a week and we're going to, so that we can le better learn how about the impacts of climate, of, of this uh, climate phenomena on the health. Thank you to our three speakers, Julian, Andres and Rodney. Thank you to the organizers and uh, thank you again for your attention, everyone, and hopefully we'll see you again on Thursday. Have a great day and we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.